Hello everyone and welcome to our Good Friday service. We are so glad that you're joining us from wherever you are around the world. And this is such an amazing opportunity that no matter where you are in the world, this day is significant for all of us in our Christian faith and that we can celebrate it together. Our time today is going to be split into three meditations and we will be hearing from different voices around us. And it covers nine hours of real time of Jesus' journey to the cross. So we will look at the events that happen from 6 to 9 a.m., then from 9 till noon, and then noon till 3. And then we'll, we're able to share in communion together. So as you get ready, won't you get your, some elements ready so that you can partake in communion? But I just want to invite you here this morning to stop and to pause and stop whatever you're doing and just engage in the reflection of the journey to the cross. Let me begin the story in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 15 records it like this. It says, Very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law, the entire high council, met to discuss their next step. Now, this high council is also known as the Sanhedrin. They were the final authority among the Jewish people when it came to religious or political matters. They were like the high court in Jerusalem. They bound Jesus, led him away and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Now, the Sanhedrin didn't have power or authority to execute people. Only Rome could do that, which is why they took Jesus to Pilate. Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, You have said it. Then the leading priests kept accusing him of many crimes. And Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer them? Or what about all these charges they are bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing much to Pilate's surprise. You see, Jesus makes no statements in his defense against the false accusations of the Sanhedrin. He, he knew that this was his path to take. This was the road that he had to walk. The road of self-sacrifice. Now, earlier on in Jesus' life, he'd said that no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friends. And here we got to see the actual embodiment of just that. So he gave himself up with no fight, no defense. And now we don't know if any of his friends or any of his followers, his disciples, were in the crowd at the time. But if they were, I can only imagine that they would have been so incredibly confused at this point. But why isn't he standing up to them? Why isn't he defending himself? Why doesn't he just do something incredible, like some form of miracle, and just quiet them once and for all? Now, if his followers were there, they would have remembered his teachings. But if this was the love that he spoke of, then this love was reckless. This love was self-sacrificing. And we speak to the fact that while Jesus was fully God, he was also fully human like you and me. As a human, it's incredibly hard not to speak up when you've been wrongfully accused. Think of your own life and moments like that that you've been a part of. It's hard to keep quiet against the, the hatred and the lies. Everything within him must have wanted to defend himself, to defend his honor, but he didn't. In fact, he didn't say a word. 
what kind of love is this? Doesn't Jesus realize what this would lead to? Well, the passage continues. Now, it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner, anyone the people requested. One of the prisoners at the time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release to you this King of the Jews? Pilate asked. For he realized by now that the leading priests had arrested Jesus out of envy. But at this point, the leading priest stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. And Pilate asked them, Then what should I do with this man you call the King of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Why? Pilate demanded. What crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead tip. They turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. It's nine o'clock in the morning and we're told there's this guy by the name of Simon of Cyrene. And, and Cyrene excites me because this tells me he has a guy from Africa and, and we represented here. But he would have come to, to, to Jerusalem because it was Passover and there's certain things he would have expected. But this was not to be expected because it wasn't going to be the same as all the others. He was coming probably to see this Messiah that everybody was talking about, this guy that, you know, is causing blind eyes to be opened, healing the cripple, casting out demons, and, and he comes with this expectation, but he's met with something so different that morning. There he is, uh, he is on, on the road, a cobblestone road, and they say it's a road to Golgotha, and he hears that he has this Messiah, this man called Jesus, carrying a cross to his own execution. He, he, I can see him pushing through the crowd just to get a glimpse of this man. And, and, and he sees something so different. He has a person that's been beaten, that's been flogged, probably full of blood. The people are jeering, mocking him, spitting at him. And he's carrying a cross. And, and while he's carrying this cross, he stumbles across uh, on, on the road. And he goes down to, to kind of help him and he meets the gaze of Jesus and he looks into these eyes and probably eyes that you would expect to be angry, just malicious eyes, just wanting revenge. But Simon of Cyrene did not see that. He looked into eyes full of love. And then he hears, hey you, you, he turns and he sees a Roman soldier saying, yes, I'm talking to you. Help this man. And he picks up the cross to help Jesus. I mean, he picked up the cross. And then they walk along and he goes and they get to the place where Jesus is finally going to be executed. And he has to endure this banging of nails and probably some excruciating cries from Jesus. And eventually they drop the cross into the hole and he actually watches Roman soldiers around there casting lots for, for the cloak that was around Jesus, his clothes. And then to make matters worse, they even put the sign on the top of the cross to say, yes, the King of the Jews in a mocking way. And I can just picture this, this scene of disappointment because this is not what he expected. But what I love in the story is that he looked into the eyes of love.
At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. And at about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed so that he could drink. But the rest said, wait, let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. <laughs> then Jesus shouted out again and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened and they said, this man was truly the son of God. I can imagine the scene. Jesus had been on the cross for about three hours just lying there in his distress and all of a sudden there's this massive total eclipse. A three hour eclipse is now in motion. By now I'm sure the mocking and the joking around the cross had stopped. People in the city would have known what was going on outside the city and must have been wondering if the strange occurrence was somehow connected. For three hours, people wondered and waited for what was going to happen next. I can't imagine how strange and eerie that must have been. Then suddenly the earth began to shake, rocks split apart and the temple veil is torn right down the middle. Jesus has one last conversation with the Father and he surrenders himself saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And Jesus dies. It's over. At least as far as they saw it. Sure, the soldiers are quoted as saying, surely this man was a son of God. But the operative word is was. Not now. Now he is dead. Jesus had predicted this moment and he told them exactly why it had had to happen. And I don't think that that played much into how they were feeling at the moment. When we listen to the story from this vantage point of knowing what happened on the Sunday, we know the, the rest of the story. And it's easy for Good Friday to come and go without us remembering. We just jump straight into the resurrection. But let us not forget the cross. The events of that first Good Friday may feel far away, um, in fact thousands of years away, but in fact it's so real for us because on Thursday night before that Good Friday, Jesus sets before us real things, bread and wine, and it tells the story. And it's not a story we read about other people far away, but a story that is real for you and for me today. Because on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, which was before the events of the early morning of Good Friday, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to his father and he broke it. And as the bread tears apart, he says, this is my body which is broken for you. And we have remembered today in very real and stark terms, the broken body of Jesus for us. He says, take and eat and remember. We remember God's love. We remember his incredible sacrificial love for us. In the same way, after they had shared that meal together, Jesus takes the cup. And he says to his friends, this is my blood of the new covenant. And we have just remembered the incredible story of, of, of Jesus' blood shed for us. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So take and drink and be thankful. Take and drink and remember. So as we share together in communion, and we're deeply connected from wherever you are to where I am, to where everyone else is uh, joining in this meal today, we are deeply connected by the sacrificial love of God, His forgiveness and His grace. 
So let's share in this meal together. This is the body of Jesus, and it is broken for you and for me. We take and eat, and we remember. This is the blood of Jesus, shed for you and for me. We take and drink, and we are thankful. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you have fed us in this meal together. Thank you, Lord, that you anticipated our lack of capacity to see, and so you've given us an experience of bread broken and wine poured out for us, your blood. I pray, Lord, that you would nourish us. I pray, Lord, that you would heal us. I pray, Lord, that you'd fill us with your love and grace that as we live out this Good Friday and the days out ahead, we would sense your ever powerful presence with us. We go, Lord, into the rest of our day in the power of your spirit so that we might live and work to your glory. Amen. Amen. I pray that this has been an experience of, of uh, God's presence and love for us. And we look forward to catching up with you on Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday, where we know uh, that the story doesn't end with a Good Friday account. See you on Sunday.
keep